job is um, looking at the geographical areas best suited to clients. Sometimes um, a client will say, I want to live in Concord, but we end up buying in Dremoyne or uh, Hunters Hill, because I look at uh, how their life might evolve over the next few years and why that area. Um, similarly, we might go from Hunters Hill and end up in Concord, uh, but it's just about understanding my clients and maybe pointing out a few different areas they might not have considered. So I go from sourcing properties through to setting buying parameters for them. So they might come to me with a certain budget and I feel that they don't need to spend that or I feel they need to spend a little bit more. So I set all that up front. Uh, I, I bid at auction. So I'm employed in a few different ways. The first way is just a bid at auction. I may never have seen the property before. I might never have met the clients before. Sometimes they're interstate or overseas and I just get appointed remotely. Uh, and I just turn up on the day and you know, win the place for them. So I'm the person putting my hand up. And so much of that is about strategy. Sometimes the strategies are thrown out the window uh, because you can't control the market forces. But for sure, when you've got someone bidding there for you on the day of the auction, uh, it, you're, you're there and you're professional and they realise that you've, they've got someone bidding on their behalf and sometimes you just um, buyers will drop away. So there's impact in having someone bid for you. The other way is where a client will find a property and they just appoint me to handle the negotiations. Uh, so I'll visit the property, I'll establish buying parameters there, the pricing parameters, and then handle the negotiations. But the, the way that I'm more than, often not, uh, more than often appointed is they'll say, I want to buy a property in a certain area. I'll go out and do all the shortlist of the property, show them the best of what I've seen, usually within their lunch hour. Uh, and then once we've found the perfect property, then I handle negotiations and sometimes carry through to settlement. Uh, sometimes I organise uh, all the services surrounding that, but it's a small part of what I do. So the art of property negotiation. Uh, you may or may not have bought property before. Uh, and I think harking back to your last purchase is is sometimes very traumatic for people because they might have seen through 100 properties in their property search. Sometimes you'll see one and you just fall in love with it and away you go. Uh, it's very important when you are negotiating to save as much as you can. And when it is an emotive purchase, be your own. I refer to myself as, as an emotional handbrake sometimes that I'll say, no, we don't need to go there. We don't need to go to that price. We've got to sort of wind it back a little bit. Uh, but um, you've got to realise if you're looking, whether it's for an investment or, or a property that you're going to live in, uh, a $50,000 saving might be your exit cost if you have to sell in a few years' time, if you're going to live overseas or you decide you want a different property and you're selling, uh, that that $50,000 saving is significant. Uh, $50,000, I guess, over a life of a loan might mean a $100,000 saving. Uh, so understanding that vendors need to sell is very important. So ask the selling agent why are they selling. Sometimes you'll get the truth, sometimes you won't. Sorry if there are any selling agents here. Uh, but a lot of this you can read in the contract. So find out um, when the searches were prepared. So if you see a property that's on the market in May, but the searches were prepared back in November, then you can very quickly realise that they had a crack on the market back in November. They're probably sick to death of being on the market and there's a bargain to be had there. So understanding the way contracts look and getting uh, advice from the solicitor around why they're selling. So sometimes you'll see a contract on the certificate of title, you'll find uh, two mortgages. That's wonderful for me because I see that there's a, probably a real need to sell there. So understanding the contract is very, very important. Uh, so pest and building report, I've, my first property I bought had a disastrous pest and building, my own personal property had a disastrous pest and building report, it had active termites, uh, you know, back then it was 178000 on the central coast, but I worked out that there was $5,000 worth of treatment in the property, uh, I got a $30,000 reduction, which, you know, 178000 is significant, uh, and $5,000 later I... I, I was done and dusted, so there was a, a saving there of 25000 So that type of thing, uh, if you've got the ability to go through and do work in a property, use the pest and building report if it is negative and you feel that you can work through the work, then by all means don't necessarily walk away from a property because there are problems. There might be a saving there for you. This almost sounds very predatory, but you know, it's part of saving on property. 
Uh, so look at the past selling history of the property. It's very important. You might find that it sold two years ago uh, or may have been on the market six months ago, like I was talking about the searches before. Uh, so understanding the selling agents, the way they work is important as well. So you, I'll look at, uh, the, say, the last five sales in that, in that office and particularly that agent. And if I see that an agent has a tendency to sell a property prior to auction, then I'll know that that's the way I'm going to go. Uh, I don't want to go out there and compete with the general market. I want to get in there and negotiate as well as I can prior to auction. Uh, and it doesn't always happen, but, but more times than not, if there's a pattern there that, they've, that the agent sold prior to auction before, they'll do it again. Because that's the way they prepare their clients. Um, so keep the agent informed if you're interested in the property, but don't overplay it. Certainly ask for a copy of the contract if you're interested in a, in a property, because they're somewhat duty bound to come back to you and say, you're a contract holder, there's been an offer submitted. Whereas if you don't ask for a copy of a contract, then it might just sell out from underneath you, sell prior to auction. Uh, so um, uh, very important for an agent you haven't dealt with before, keep your chatter or talk about the property backed up by email. Because if you ever need a little bit of recourse and say, why did you sell it without me knowing, then it, there's not a lot you can do about it, but just to have that, that um, all backed up with all written offers, particularly have them all written. Uh, so in an offer, in an auction campaign, it's very important, particularly in the inner west market, don't submit your offer in the first week of the campaign unless it's very low. Wait until the second week. So they've had their first Saturday open house, they've had their second Saturday, then on the Monday or Tuesday, submit your offer then. So I've um, <coughs> told you a little bit about my history. I was a selling agent for 17 years. Uh, I've been a buyer's agent for five of those. For, been probably 22 years, I was a selling agent for 17, buyer's agent for five of those. Uh, I've got the benefit of knowing how vendors think. If you put in an offer in the first week after the first Saturday, most vendors will want to see what transpires on the second Saturday of an auction campaign. And you've, you're almost submitting an offer for no reason. So more times than not, the first week of campaigns not the time to be submitting an offer. Now this is my golden, golden rule. If you can take away anything tonight about property negotiation on an auction particularly, uh, here's one of them. Never submit an offer on Friday if you can't exchange on a Friday. In the inner west particularly, uh, so I deal in all areas of Sydney and a little bit central coast as well, uh, you're looking at, um, they'll have Saturday open houses. What you'll have if you submit an offer, let's say there's a, a property on the market with a price guide of 800 plus. Uh, if you submit an offer of 850, it gives the agent the ability to say at the open house, I've got an offer for 850. And that's not what you want bandied around. So unless you can exchange that day for 850 and get it, get the offer accepted, hold your offer to a Monday or Tuesday when it's going to be uh, better received and the agent can't use it as leverage with other buyers. Remember that. Never submit an offer on a Friday unless you can exchange. Uh, so give a time that the offer expires. So I'll give... Um, most offers I give to the agent will be in the form of a written contract with... Um, perhaps no cooling off period and a cheque attached. When I do that, I say it's on the table until 5 p.m. today or 12 p.m. tomorrow, whatever the case may be. Uh, after that, I'm moving on to the next property. So there's always a backup property uh, with the risen. With the risen. Um, it's, it's very important that you put that time frame in mind. Otherwise, there's too much time for the agent to be ringing around trying to drum up more offers. You want to shorten that time as much as possible. Are there any selling agents in the room, by the way? I like you all. <laughs> um, so definitely be the buyer they want to sell to. I was um, competing for a property in Earlwood um, six months ago, and I had the, the family with me, who were my clients, and I saw the vendor coming out. This is a great opportunity. So I dragged my clients out of the car, and. We just bumped into the vendor. Now they saw that they're a lovely family and you know, just got chatting, we weren't, we weren't pushy, but in the end, they sold to my clients because they were the buyer they wanted to sell to. This was a long-term held family property. Uh, they liked the idea of a family buying it, the kids were there, it was a lovely scenario. So be the buyer they want to sell to. Don't be that necessarily that confrontational buyer that they think, 
I'll do anything so that they don't buy my property. Just be that warm, fuzzy buyer they all want to buy, that they all want to sell to. So when bidding at auction, be brash or be bold. Uh, there's a tendency, particularly with buyers agents, um, to hold back and wait for someone else to open the bidding. Just get in there, get amongst it. Uh, don't be afraid to put in the first bid. Most auctions start and there's silence for a good three minutes. Uh, but to be that person, stamp your authority over the property is a really important thing. Uh, if you're brash and bold in the beginning, you might just shake a few buyers at the end who think they're never going to stop. Um, very recently I bid at an auction for my clients, I won it, and straight after the underbidders came up to me and said I need your card because we saw that you weren't going to stop and, I, and in reality I was at my limit, but um, just that idea that you're going to keep going, you're going to keep going, you might as well drop out now. So be brash, be bold, and just get amongst the bidding. Uh, if all else fails, get me, get a buyer's agent on your side. Um, so buyer's agents have been around for probably the last 10 years in Australia. They're very, very popular and common in the UK and certainly in the US, where usually there are, there's an age of working both sides of the fence, I guess. So we're, we're all very au fait with the idea of getting a selling agent to sell your property. But just get represented. There are lots of good buyers agents around. Some of them specialise in in certain areas. Um, some of them specialise in certain types of properties. I love to self-manage super fund purchases because it's sort of unlocking a lot of the potential, the monetary potential that we all have. And um, so I sometimes buy properties within self-managed super funds. And my my experience in property has been. Oh, anything from a um, tiny studio, 200000 right up to $6 million properties. And I've sort of seen that whole range of properties trading. But this new influx of self-managed super fund properties is, is part of the reason why I have my company now. Um, because there is there's such potential there to be looking at really interesting properties. So I'll tell you about my most recent property. Um, I have a young family. We were looking. We just had. We we're putting plans into council. I might have told you, Jace. There was. Um, we were looking to go up another level. We 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 did a pre DA, which is before doing the DA to go up another level to sound council out. Uh, and we were looking at going up a whole other story. It's in Balmain. It's not a tiny, tiny house. And uh, then I came across this block of flats, and I thought, look at this. I've got. Um, Move into one flat when I can afford to and don't need the income, I can tap into the next level, then the next level above that. So those sort of creative purchases are they're out there. Uh, you know, we we probably only pay 30% more than what our uh, old property was. We traded within the same area, but those those very malleable creative properties are fantastic because what it means uh, financially, we can potentially strata title them, we're in the process of that now, and we can load up the debt on one and get rid of the debt on another if we're living in it. So it's a very malleable investment. Uh, so be a little bit creative with your property purchase. And look, if you've ever got any questions, whether you're a client or not, feel free just to send me an email and and you know, nine times out of 10, myself or a colleague might have seen the property you're looking at, and you just send me a quick email and I'll give you a bit of advice around it. So on the property front, there's a lot of potential out there, it's just a matter of, of moving a little bit further than buying your existing property and hold it for 30 years. We've changed over the last 20 years probably uh, into being a more property savvy mob, but there's a whole other realm of property stuff out there. So if you'd like a copy of any, any of these slides tonight, um, again, just maybe send Jace a quick email or myself and yeah, happy to pass on the tips. Happy watching.